So the embryonic stage is going to start at the beginning of the second week and going through to the eighth week when we have placental formation. The main internal organs will develop and the major external body structures appear. So the primary germ layers we see here serve as primitive tissues or precursor type tissues that will later form these organs. These are going to be these three layers here, and this is going to be the endoderm, the mesoderm, and the ectoderm. So these are the germ layers that will later form the organs and tissues. So the embryo obviously needs a source of nourishment and support. And so we have these several structures here that do that. Umbilical cord, the chorion, the amnion, yolk sac, and placenta. Uh, we have chorionic villi that extend out from the trophoblast into the endometrium in order to assist in this. So by the second week, that primordial embryo has formed those three primary germ layers, and we call them, we call that now a gastrula. So we have names for these different stages. We have the zygote, uh, in early development, I should say, prenatally. The zygote, which is the first 12 to 24 hours, and then cleavage, which is 30 hours to about the third day. Then the third to fourth day, we have the morula, which is that solid ball of cells. Fifth day through the second week, it is termed the blastocyst. And then by the end of the second week, we have those primary germ layers, and we call it the gastrula. All right, so those primary uh, germ layers here are pulled out and you can see the major body parts that are derived from the endoderm, from the endoderm are the epithelial lining of the digestive tract, the uh, lining of the respiratory tract and the urinary bladder. Then the major body part from the ectoderm Uh, is the nervous system and the skin. And then the chorion uh, projects into the endometrium and it's going to help uh, form the placenta. The amnion here is a membrane that encircles the developing embryo. You can also see the yolk sac here as well. So the amnion is going to develop and surround the embryo and connect the, uh, and the umbilical cord is going to form from the structures and help connect. And this is going to be in the connecting stalk. The amniochorionic membrane here is going to form uh, because of the fusion of the chorion and the amnion. So hence the name uh, amniochorionic. So here you can see a pretty quick development occurs here of the human embryo. In A here, this is three weeks, and B is three and a half weeks, and just one week later, C is four weeks. So the placental membrane has an endothelium uh, of an embryonic capillary and an epithelial wall of chorionic villus. You can see this outlined over here, the chorionic villi. Uh, at right, you can see the placenta has both a maternal portion here. Uh, so we have maternal, and then we also have an embryonic portion as well. By eight weeks, we can actually recognize the embryo as human. So this is a really important clinical application here. These are some different substances that can affect uh, an unborn child during development. Um, thalidomide uh, was prescribed to pregnant women, which was actually believed to, uh, or I did, alleviate nausea. And it caused a worldwide tragedy. Before this occurred, we believe that the placenta protected the fetus 100% from harmful substances. We did not believe that anything caused uh, would travel across the placenta. We didn't have any transplacental uh, medications. This caused this severe limb deformity here. This crab-like claw feature is a uh, one that is predominant in children that were born this way. Um, and so this was a really terrible thing that happened. Uh, rubella is also a teratogen. Uh, we get vaccinations for uh, rubella. Teratogens are substances that can cause congenital uh, malformations. In 1941, there was an epidemic of rubella. You know, we talk about uh, our MMR shot, that's measles, mumps, and rubella, uh, that caused 20,000 birth defects and 30,000
50,000 stillborn births in the United States. So this is very important for us to be able to explain to patients why having their rubella vaccine is so important, even for their children who may be of childbearing uh, age at some point in their life, or they will be if they continue to live, obviously. Um, and so rubella can cause also cataracts, deafness, heart defects, speech and hearing problems, and even things like diabetes. So vaccination programs have greatly reduced the incidence of what we call congenital rubella syndrome. Next, we have alcohol, and we are learning that even one or two drinks um, in the wrong time of prenatal development can cause uh, problems, and uh, too many drinks can cause what we call fetal alcohol syndrome. You can see this in these pictures here, okay? All right, so fetal alcohol syndrome will cause the child to have a very small head, misshapen eyes, and a flat face and nose. It causes slow growth, impaired intelligence, and even learning disabilities. They can also have poor social and communication skills and a lack of understanding the consequences of their actions and problems interpreting social clues. Cigarettes are dangerous as well. They have chemicals which put the fetus under stress. Carbon monoxide crosses the placenta and binds to the oxygen, basically starving the uh, developing fetus of oxygen. So um, smoking is associated with miscarriage, stillbirth, premature birth, and low birth weight. Malnutrition, of course, can cause problems as well. It can cause what we call intrauterine growth retardation. It can uh, alter the metabolism and set the stage for things like obesity later on in life or obesity-related disorders like diabetes. Uh, and lastly, we can come into contact with things at work, like occupational hazards. These come in the form of, again, teratogens from chemicals, heavy metals, materials that have dye or lead in them. So all of these things are factors that can cause a higher rate of spontaneous abortion, which is a miscarriage or birth defects. So the fetal stage begins eight weeks after fertilization. Growth is very quick and rapid and body proportions change a lot. The head is very large, um, the lower limbs are short and they gradually change to resemble those of a child. Um, the organ systems, organ systems are mostly formed, although they can be immature. So this is why if a baby is born prematurely, things like the lungs have not had enough time to develop. So the head is disproportionately large compared to the rest of the, <laughs> the rest of the body at the beginning of the stage. So the external genitalia of a fetus can be distinguished as male or female by about 12 weeks after fertilization. This figure shows us how the external reproductive organs begin to differentiate from precursor structures. So they all kind of begin the same and then they begin to differentiate. So over here we can see the male and here we can see the female and they both start out as in figure a right here, okay? Um, actually, you can even look here, the general, genital tubercle, urogenitor folds, and labioscrotal folds, okay? And so then they're going to begin to differentiate after we go here. And it's going to develop into the penis and then the glands penis and the scrotum eventually for the male. And then for the female, the same structures are going to develop into the clitoris, labia minor and major, uh, the glands uh, clitoris, hymen, and vaginal orifice. And and so these just begin to differentiate at a stage in fetal development. So here we can just see that we have the amniotic sac and amniotic fluid surrounding uh, the fetus here that protects the, in, the embryo here from being jarred by movements. So there are some differences between fetal blood circulation and adult circulation. A major difference is uh, that in the fetus, the inferior vena cava actually contains blood that is high in oxygen. The maternal blood supplies oxygen, nutrients, and carries the waste back out. So substances diffuse between the myrtle... <laughs> <laughs> maternal and fetal blood through the placental membrane and umbilical vessels. Uh, the fetal blood, again, has more oxygen-carrying capacity to it. 
So in the fetal cardiovascular system, we have the umbil umbilical vein, which is transporting oxygen-rich blood and nutrients from the placental placenta to the fetal body. Then that goes on, uh, half of the blood goes to the liver and half passes through the ductus venosus, which joins the uh, inferior vena cava. So there the oxygen rich blood from the placenta is going to mix with the oxygen poor blood from the lower parts of the body and then traveling on to the right atrium. We have the ductus arteriosus which allows fetal blood to move from the pulmonary trunk into the arter uh, aorta. So ductus arteriosus is up here. All right. And so ductus arteriosus uh, is going to allow the fetal blood to move from the pulmonary trunk into the aorta. After birth, the foramen ovale is closed as a result of increasing pressure in the left atrium. And this is an opening through the atrial septum moving to the left atrium, not to be confused with a foramen ovale in the skull. <laughs> okay, it's just a name. So pregnancy is going to terminate or stop with what we call parturition, which is the birth process. This is a positive feedback mechanism. We have inhibition of progesterone, which starts the process of childbirth. Progesterone suppresses uterine contraction during pregnancy, and so we lift that um, progesterone um, inhibition and so that will trigger the uterine contractions. So uterine stretching will cause oxytocin to be released from uh, the posterior notice it was posterior not anterior pituitary which causes uterine contractions and these are going to cycle up you're going to have greater excitability of the myometrium which is the muscle layer which is going to help the layer labor progress progress. So the baby's head is down and in position and the contractions are going to press that head against the cervix which is going to trigger those stretch receptors stimulating even stronger contractions. So this is positive feedback and it's going to produce strong contractions until maximum effort is reached. The cervix is also going to dilate or open up to 10 centimeters preferably. That's what you really need is 10 centimeters. Um, Okay, so the cervix is going to dilate and it's going to open up and the fetus is going to be forced through the birth canal to the outside. So these are some of the stages in birth. In A here, we have the fetal position, the fetus in correct position before labor. Uh, in B, we begin to see dilation of the cervix occur as the head compresses on the cervix. Um, in C, you can see the, the fetus is being expelled or is coming out. And then lastly, we'll have expulsion of the placenta. Oxytocin causes a continued contraction of the ureters, which compresses bleeding vessels and minimizes blood loss. Um, as we nurse, this continues to cause oxytocin to release, which helps the uterus to shrink back to its normal size. So in the day or two before milk secretion begins, the breast secrete colostrum. Colostrum is very important for the fetus. This is the first milk. It's a watery fluid. It's rich in protein. It's rich in antibodies. It has lower amounts of carbohydrates and fats. It helps the, the fetus to, or the uh, now infant, to uh, release the uh, meconium, which is the first bowel movement, which is a very atypical of a normal bowel movement. So colostrum is very important, and this is going Going to help protect your baby. Uh, prolactin is released um, during pregnancy, but milk secretion does not begin until after the birth because progesterone again inhibits milk production by blocking the action of prolactin there. So once the placenta is expelled, prolactin is no longer inhibited by those placental hormones and so the mammary glands will begin to secrete milk. It takes place about two to three days uh, after birth here within a few days mature milk and that can differ per person. Now there's a lot of misconceptions especially in this this area of the country that people can't produce good milk or they don't produce milk uh, and a lot enough milk. A lot of this is due to the fact that people use things like pacifiers or give bottles which can can interfere with milk production. Milk production is based primarily on the amount of sucking the infant does. So the more the infant nurses, the more milk you are going to produce. 
There are also problems that can be overcome if you get help from a lactation consultant. And there are specialists out there that can help you with things like if you have an inverted nipple or perhaps if your child uh, is tongue tied and not latching on properly. And so uh, having mother's milk is so instrumental to even growth of the brain in an infant. So if this is something that you are comfortable doing, I highly recommend you do it. And if you have problems, seek out something like the La Leche League and they will help you to overcome uh, any problems that you may have. So if you've ever nursed a baby, you are familiar with the let down reflex, which always happens in the most inconvenient time, like when you're standing in store in the grocery line, right? And a baby cries and then all of a sudden all of your milk lets down. OK, and so if you don't have something in place to gather that, you're going to wind up with a wet shirt and a little bit of embarrassment. OK, so milk doesn't flow readily through the duct system of the mammary glands, but it's ejected as a through specialized myoepithelial cells that surround the alveolar glands. So that's muscle skin cells. So this is controlled by a reflex action when the baby sucks, which causes oxytocin to be released. And then you find out later on that we have a learned stimulus response to the crying of a baby. And that's when you can have that letdown if it's close to time to feeding that letdown response happens, like I said, at an inappropriate time. And so the postnatal period is going to last from the moment of birth until death, and it can be divided into the neonatal period. We have in infancy, childhood, adolescence, adulthood, and senescence, which includes dying. So once the baby is born and they take that first breath, they're going to enter the neonatal period. Um, the first breath, by the way, must be really forceful because the baby's lungs are collapsed and there's a surface tension adhering the membranes together. Um, when you are full term, uh, the surfactant is released to reduce surface tension. Um, several factors stimulate a newborn's first breath. Higher carbon dioxide concentrations, lower pH, low oxygen, low body temperature, and mechanical stimulation, which is what the doctors will often do. So neonatal period from birth to the first uh, end of the first month, four weeks. And this is where you're going to see a continuation or the beginning of respiration outside of the body, uh, obtaining nutrients, digestion. They basically eat, sleep, and poop. <laughs> if you're lucky and they're not colicky. So infancy occurs from the end of the first month or the fourth week throughout the first year. Uh, in this stage, the growth occurs quickly. You can even triple the birth weight. Uh, as the muscular and nervous system matures, uh, we have coordinated muscular activities become possible. They roll over, they sit up, they begin to walk sometimes. Uh, so soon they're able to visually follow and track objects. They reach for and grasp objects. They stand up. Adequate nutrition and vitamins are very important to keep up with the very high growth rate. So childhood is the period from one year extending until puberty. The child learns to communicate, speak, read, write, and, and think. And we have emotional maturity occurring. And of course, we have those um, developmental milestones like uh, permanent teeth appearing. Uh, we also have bladder and bowel controls that are established in early childhood um, and muscular, more muscular control and coordination. So once puberty occurs, we enter adolescence. So adolescence is between childhood, I'm sorry, puberty occurs between childhood and adolescence. It's that transition stage. Uh, and this will be until you reach adulthood. So the person becomes re reproductive Actively functional, emotionally mature, we still have growth skills, uh, growth spurts, our motor skills develop, and intellectual abilities also continue to develop. We have secondary sex characteristics that begin to appear during puberty, and this is going to be earlier for females than it is for males. So adulthood starts at adolescence and continues until old age. Uh, you remain relatively stable, unchanged anatomically and physiologically until we begin to see some de degeneration. So around the end of the third decade, so 30s, signs of aging begin to appear. We have a loss of elasticity of ligaments between small bones um, in the back. Our hearing can decrease. Our heart muscles begin to thicken. Uh, thicken. Uh, metabolism slows. Gray hair begins to appear 
or hair even begins to fall out and thin. Vision becomes a little more far-sighted. Weight increases. At about 50, that decline continues more rapidly. Nail growth slows. Taste buds begin to die. Skin loosens its elasticity, so we get even more wrinkles. Um, and then farsightedness gets worse. Women begin to stop, uh, begin menopause and stop menstruating. You can have insulin resistance. Muscle mass and weight begin to decrease as you get close to the age of 60. Men have about half the strength as they once did and about half the lung function as in their early 20s. Height decreases. Uh, around 60 memory losses occur uh, and the height can decrease by up to a full inch. You have sagging skin, a loss of connective tissue will make your nose, ears, and eyes become more prominent and look larger. So the study of the aging process on biological, molecular, cellular, organismal, and even population levels is called gerontology. Uh, this is the process of aging, and it can be difficult to analyze. Uh, this is both going to be an active and a passive process. So the passive process of aging is where we have a breakdown of structures and a slowing of functions. On a molecular level, passive aging is seen uh, in things like the de degeneration of elastin and collagen proteins in the connective tissues. And then we see that uh, as the result of that as uh, skin sagging and muscles losing their firmness. So during a lifetime, our biochemical ab abnormalities accumulate. Lipids are broken down. Mitochondria begin to break down. Uh, older cells decrease in the energy supplies that, that are needed. Free radicals are also associated uh, with um, degeneration as well. A free radical is a, a molecule that has an, an unpaired electron, which makes it very reactive. And it likes to pull electrons from other molecules, which can cause damage in tissues. So uh, free radicals are a byproduct of normal metabolism, but we can also get exposed to them by radiation or toxic chemicals. So we also have active aging, which entails new activities or the appearance of new substances uh, like uh, lipofusion granules can form from the breakdown of lipids. We can have some autoimmunity occur. That's self attacking self, right? Uh, and then we also have apoptosis, which is the process of program cell death. Um, this occurs even from the embryo because it's a part of doing things like removing the webbing between the fingers and toes. Uh, so it's a normal process. It occurs regular, regularly in the embryo, breaking down those structures, making ways for new ones. But um, it's a normal part of life, and so this can continue to occur throughout your life. So the last stage is senescence, and this is old age until death. This is the result of normal wear and tear of body parts over the years. Your cartilage at the joints uh, begins to disappear, disintegrate basically, and cause stiff, painful joints. Uh, that is, of course, it has environmental factors that contribute to that. Gas exchange and blood cir circulation become poor. Your metabolic rate changes. Immunity and repair responses get weaker. Death usually results not from the degenerative changes, but from some mechanical disturbance in things like the cardiovascular system, a failure of the immune system, or a disease process that affects a vital organ. So nearing the end of life is a very personal process. A person who has been ill for a very long time will show signs generally of impending death often. And this often occurs in a sequence. And we have two stages. We have preactive dying, which may take up to three months, and then we have active dying that has a distinct set of signs. Preactive dying can take three months. Some are aware of what is happening and begin to actually withdraw. They lose interest in the outside world. They don't want to see friends or their relatives. They often sleep more and may not get out of bed every day. Um, they have a lag in conversation. Interest in eating can disappear or it can become difficult because they have issues with swallowing. Signs of active dying may appear only the day before death or even up to two weeks before. This person sleeps, but they can be woken up easily. Um, if you're asleep, uh, they can still often hear when they're asleep. Time, place, and identities can be confused. People often go back in time and talk to a deceased spouse or parent. The organ systems then begin to shut down. Blood pressure will drop below 70 over 50. Um, 
circulation is poor and limbs feel cool to the touch and some may actually have a last burst of energy a day or two right before death occurs right before death a person can lose control of immediately before uh, their bowels or bladder and breathing becomes irregular and the pulse can become very thready so the human lifespan is approximately 120 years. Life expectancy is the realistic projection of how long we actually live. Right now in the US, life expectancy is 75.4 for men and 83.2 uh, for women. We have many medical advances that have contributed to improving the life expectancy. This has greatly been increased from say 40 to 50 years a few hundred years ago. Antibiotics are one. These have tamed some very lethal infections, uh, vaccinations, drugs that allow people with cancer to survive, things like heart bypasses, um, beta blockers, uh, that type of thing. Uh, so we've had a lot of ways to extend things, but during this current crisis of COVID-19, you can see that, that uh, nature tends to have a way of throwing curveballs. And so there will always be these periodic outbreaks, global crises uh, that come along and that may take people out um, in large amounts. Um, so although we can alter our environment more than other species, there are just some forces of nature which are beyond our control.